I call your attention to the front of our bulletin and the painting from one of our homeless artists, Edwin Fuller. Very appropriate to the topic that we are looking at today, a person who feels like maybe evil is literally drowning them in the stuff of life. Let us pray together. Gracious and merciful God, you have given us a word that we can hear and understand through Jesus Christ that is consistent with your prophets. And so we want to listen and we want to understand and we want to act. So help us now as we hear to put this word into practice. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's text is in the context of Mark chapter 6. The first part of Mark chapter 6 you heard from last week with Rebecca's sermon on rejection. This is the second of two stories of the patterns of evil that begin to take over villages and households. A closed attitude. And in the midst of that, Jesus inviting the disciples and the apostles to go out and find open homes, open villages, where they can create places that can perform good news, the healings and the exorcisms, and they're not going to be in the presence of closed households and villages. And then we come to this story regarding John the Baptist. King Herod heard of everything that Jesus was doing and of Jesus' name who had become known. Some were saying that John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask for me, of me, I will give you even up to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? And her mother replied, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. That soldier went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. And when John's disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The word of the Lord.
One of the more gruesome passages in the entire Bible. It is about a dysfunctional household that was becoming a dysfunctional government and bringing evil along with it. At about the age of four, our oldest daughter was very disturbed one evening when we were putting her to bed and she looked at both of us as parents. She says, why are there evil people in the world? I don't understand why people would want to hurt other people. And that's a question that many of us ask. We also ask the question on occasion how we contribute to the evil. In what ways are we also participating inadvertently with patterns that are hurting human beings? In the Old Testament, there is a theological pattern that probably was established somewhere in the teaching of Moses regarding the identification of what everything God created was good. First day it was good, second day good, sixth day it's very good. And that theme of goodness or not goodness carries throughout the Pentateuch. And we find a case where Moses is practicing a behavior that is clearly identified as not good. It's as close to the Old Testament's declaration that Moses is out of line. He's practicing a behavior pattern that's probably more like Pharaoh and will contribute to the evil of what goes on among God's people than be helpful. Jethro, his father-in-law, comes to him and watches him one day and notices that Moses literally has to be the center of attention and authority for everything that's going on. He stands among the people and keeps calling attention to himself every day, all day long, and it's wearing him out and it's worn his family out. And his father-in-law says to him, Moses, what you're doing is not good. See, you've learned the pattern that you've seen in Pharaoh of constantly drawing all people to yourself as if you're in control of everything. That's not the way God wants you to behave. And Jethro gives Moses some guidance. What you need to do, and God wants you to do this, is you need to start empowering other people to have authority. You can teach them how to do leadership. You can lead them so that they can lead others. You need to share the power. Because right now, you're holding on to all the power, and it's not good. Well, that relates to the issue around evil. When we practice behavior patterns of wanting to hold on to all the power, wanting to suck the power out of the room to ourselves, we are giving into a pattern that is not good that will contribute to the evil of the world. When we do the same thing as parents or as leaders of organizations, we are contributing to the same dark side of leadership. And we see clearly in this text that Herod He's a little ambivalent about how to do leadership, but his wife is angry enough and vindictive enough that she's made it very clear for other people that she's in charge and she's going to take no hostages. And John's imminent death has to be experienced. The Old Testament pattern for evil was the word raw, which literally means Malignant or calamitous or injurious, vicious, destructive, deadly. Anything that does damage to humanity is evil. We see a particular case in point in Genesis chapter 4. God's having a conversation with Cain and Cain has decided that 
when his offering to God is not looked upon with favor, it's Abel's fault. And so he attributes to Abel his frustration and anger and he begins to plan for Abel's demise when he hasn't dealt with his own stuff. And God has a conversation with him. Cain, if you're not careful, you're going to do some damage. You're going to give in to evil's pattern. And Cain kills his brother Abel. And God wants to stop a whole pattern of evil from spreading through the human system. So God says, well, I'm not going to allow anybody to kill Cain because this cycle of vindictiveness and vengeance will just spin out of control and that will what will be what runs humanity well God is not able to stop that turn of evil and so we see evidence that throughout history that when things are not in balance vindictiveness and vengeance become the pattern and we begin to blame other people for our pain In this particular text, Herodias is in the power block of a household that is responsible to govern people. She is one of those principalities and powers that the Apostle Paul talked about in a few places in his letters. She is one that is giving over to the dark side because she is so angry and she's identified John as the problem when she's not willing to look at herself, maybe she's the problem. Mark chapter six, I have some observations about the context of what happens. Herod was sitting on the fence. He kind of liked John, he liked to listen to him. He was an entertaining preacher. But he also had this other set of commitments to hold face, to keep face in front of his other leaders and to making a promise to his stepdaughter that he needed to fulfill and he was then set up by his wife who was probably at this point pretty good at manipulating him. And he played right into the evil. Herod was fearful that he had, and when he heard that miracles were happening out and about, he began to wonder if God was coming back to haunt him with a resurrected John the Baptist. At the same time all of this is going on on the dark side, Jesus is in another part of Galilee healing people and casting out demons and teaching his disciples to do the same. Jesus was the antithesis of what Herod and Herodias were doing. Holding all the power for themselves, Jesus was giving it away to people. Jesus was helping people rather than controlling them. Jesus was carrying on good at the same time the government was practicing evil. And that's a pattern that we see throughout the way God works in humanity. That while things in some places are turning dark and evil is taking over, evil is winning, there are places where there are open people. There are people full of grace and mercy and they are wanting to do the right thing and they are empowered to make good happen. So when we become preoccupied with how much evil there is in another part of the world or how much evil there is in another part of the city, it's a wonderful opportunity to put good actions into practice. Part of the way that we don't let evil win is to allow God's love to win in the midst of hearing all those other stories. We see in Herod's household a household of fear, a household of gossip and hearsay and rumors, guilt, 
confusion and chaos run by a manipulative woman, a codependent king and probably a codependent daughter, dysfunction at high levels. Does that sound familiar? Well, we have no place to point because sometimes the dysfunction at high levels can be right in our own businesses or in our own churches. It's possible for it to happen any place. And part of our commitment to live out the gospel is when we see it, to counter it and say no to the pattern of evil. M. Scott Peck became very noteworthy in his definition of evil in his book, The People of the Lie. Evil is the exercise of political power, the imposition of one's will upon others by overt or covert coercion. And evil usually comes about because I, as the leader, am not willing to face my own disabilities or my own sin or my own problems, and I turn and impose it on other people as if it's their problem. I blame others rather than taking a good look at myself. It's the projection of evil onto innocent persons. He calls it militant ignorance. I don't want to see who I really am, so I'm going to make life hell for the rest of you. Now, sometimes this is the way we parent our children. We don't want to take a good look at ourselves as parents. And so we began to create a certain level of ugliness in the relationships in the family household. Because evil can be both individual and communal. It can be an act of repression or oppression, but it comes about when a person decides, I can't live with anyone suggesting that I have a problem. I'm closed off. Don't talk to me about that. You talk to me about that and I will get you for it. I'm not willing to coexist with others who have a view other than my own view. That's kind of where a lot of religion in America is going. We only want to be with people who think like us and talk like us and think, uh, act like us. We don't want to be with anybody who has differences. One of the reasons I became a Presbyterian is because I got tired of hanging around people where you couldn't question anything. Presbyterians in the business of questioning everything. We hang out with questionable people. We are willing to coexist with difference or disagreement, so we hang out with disagreeable people. Because we know that if we're only with people who reflect our own view of reality, we're going to quickly turn into a very dark place. Now, I'm really trying to talk theologically here and not politically, but you know inevitably there's going to be a leakage over into politics. <laughs> Evil is narcissistic. It looks out for the person at the center. It's manipulative, intimidating, and seductive. It wouldn't surprise me that that dance the daughter did had a little edge to it. Maybe it was the stepdaughter, and maybe there was more going on there than the text talks about. But it wasn't good, and it cost John his head. Evil won. John died. And it's not too long after that that Jesus gives up his life because the Leaders of his arena of government and religion have decided he's not acceptable and they plan to get rid of him. You know, that's one of the difficulties of being a good person in the midst of some bad situations because evil does not like to coexist with somebody who's thinking outside of their box. And so it is that we as Christians are called to say no 
when we see that kind of control and heavy-handedness. And just recently, you've seen a little excerpt that we put in the bulletin from our 223rd General Assembly, where there are a list of things that the denomination articulated, and we do this every time we gather, and there's a particular reason why it happens that way. Presbyterians want to be able to vocally and publicly say no to things that they, are, they think are not going well. So we don't contribute to the evil. And this last time around, we said no to family separation. We said no to racial inequality. We said no to sexual harassment of women. We said no to gun violence. We said yes to affirm the dignity and humanity of persons of all sexual orientations and no to people that treat them less, with, with less nobility. It's interesting that in our government and in our religion, how quickly we become intolerant of anyone who disagrees with us. And that's the road to evil. It doesn't mean we shouldn't disagree. It just means it becomes evil when we choose to get rid of the disagreeable person. In Ephesians 6, probably a disciple of the Apostle Paul wrote, we don't struggle against just flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers and principalities of the dark world, against spiritual forces in high places. A high place is anyone who's in charge of something and is given over to the dark side. It can be a parent who's given over to a narcissistic view of their own reality in the family. It can be a pastor who's decided that he or she is the center of gravity for the church. It can be a denomination that's decided that they know better than anybody else. Wherever two or three are gathered, there's a high place, some place, where someone is tempted to say, you need to look at the world my way or die. Jesus was eventually crucified by people who didn't want his view of the world because it would cost them too much. And look at Jesus' reaction. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That's what Scott Peck says in his book, People to Lie. Most of these people don't have a clue that they're endangering humanity with evil practices because they're so close to any feedback, they don't get any feedback. And so evil is going to win if we don't have an open attitude towards listening for the voice of God in conversations and hear each other out in the feedback that we can give. The household is the incubator of all of this. The household in Nazareth with his family and the entire village of Nazareth somehow had become so closed off that when Jesus came back to do miracles, he couldn't do anything because they didn't want it. And so Jesus teaches his apostles, whatever you do, don't go back to Nazareth. Go to other villages where they have an open willingness to hear. They're willing to receive you and welcome you. They're willing to hear you out and create a special protected zone, a sanctuary of peace for you to function there as a full human being. The battle over evil begins at home. The battle over evil begins in the context of the church. The battle over evil begins in our comfort zones where we have to make choices to whether we're going to listen to feedback. Evil does win when people shut themselves off. But here's the phenomenal thing. The final reality is that God wins. Love wins. And even if they destroy John and they destroy Jesus, God's going to bring them back. 
Love wins in the end. And love can win in the meantime if we're willing to be servants of those that are struggling with life and we're open for the feedback. Let us pray. Gracious and truth-telling Lord, you speak to us quietly in our conscience of the things that we are not doing well, and you call us away from preoccupation with our own views to hear a bigger, a deeper, and a wider word from you. Help us to keep articulating what we hear, that we may create a world where love wins and evil loses. And when evil wins, help us to stand up as best we can in those contexts and say no. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.